It does, ah, here we go. Thank you for joining us today for the third in our panel discussion series, DEA, Who We Are and What We Do. I'm Lori Beatty, and I'm the director of the Drug Enforcement Administration's Museum here at headquarters. Our panel today represents the DEA's special agents. For 45 years, the DEA, as a component of the U.S. Department of Justice, has been the federal government's greatest weapon in the fight against the illegal drug trade. Today, with the help of over 5,000 DEA special agents, we continue to dismantle the most notorious high-level trafficking and terrorist organizations that threaten America. DEA applies the vast range of individual talents, specialized training, and skills of our special agents to the wide range of responsibilities in our vital mission. Today's three panelists come to us with decades of service advancing the DEA mission working locally in Latin America and in the Middle East. Steve Fraga has over 33 years of federal law enforcement experience working in the U.S. and in conjunction with law enforcement counterparts in countries in South and Central America. He currently serves in the DEA Special Operations Division Bilateral Investigations Unit Latin America section. Steve has spent 28 years as a special agent with DEA. Staff Coordinator Michelle Spahn served in El Paso, San Diego, and Buffalo, as well as Iraq and the United Arab Emirates before coming to work here at DEA headquarters in the Office of Congressional and Public Affairs, Community Outreach and Prevention Support Section. She is one of only two female agents who have ever completed the elite Foreign Deployed Advisory Support Team, FAST, indoctrination course. She's who you want to have with you on a dark night in a dark alley. <laughs> Staff Coordinator Amador Martinez began his career as a special agent in Los Angeles before being transferred to both Colombia and Mexico. He currently serves in the Office of Foreign Operations, supporting 15 international bilater bilateral investigative units. Our panel moderator today is Elizabeth Maurer, the Curator of Education at the DEA Museum. Today's panel will spend the next 30 minutes or so discussing DEA's special agents, including their roles, training, and other topics. At the end, we will open the floor to questions both from the in-person audience and those watching the live stream. If you are watching this live stream, please email your questions to the email address on the deamuseum.org homepage. We will remind you of the address at the end. And finally, for what we think is a first, we are being live streamed at a parents event in Mexico City. So, bienvenidos a nuestros compañeros in Mexico. Thank you, Lori. That was wonderful. And welcome, everyone, to today's panel discussion. We're very happy to see so many people who are interested in who we are and what we do here at the DEA. Uh, I'm talking about agents. So, and that's the theme of this entire uh, ongoing discussion. You all are special agents. So, how about Michelle? Can you tell us what is the very broad job description of a special agent? Well, thank you, Liz. First, I'd like to say welcome to everyone who's here in the audience as well as who is live streaming. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, special agents, broadly, uh, our job is to enforce the federal drug laws, uh, specifically the Controlled Substance Act, and to disrupt and, and dismantle the largest drug trafficking organizations that operate internationally. Okay, so it's a big job. Right? Yes. And each of you uh, have components of that big job because it's too big for one person. So I'm gonna ask to just go from one side to the other, and if you can tell the audience, and especially our folks who are watching the live stream, uh, a little bit about yourself and what your job is. So what's your current assignment, Amador? Well, uh -huh. my current assignment is uh, I offer administrative and oversight support to 15 different uh, foreign offices. These 15 offices have specialized sensitive investigation, investigative <coughs> units, and they work hand in hand with our DEA agents there for bilateral investigations. Um, when we're assigned to overseas, we agents are not officers, we're not agents, we're not law enforcement there, we don't have arrest authority. So what we do is we gather the investigative information in the United States, 
pass it over to the foreign offices where they handle their investigation, therefore the larger cartels where the cartel bosses are. As they further their investigation, they give that information back to us so that we can further our domestic investigation. So that's where I'm at right now. Okay, I think that's so interesting that you're DEA around the world. And I know Michelle, who has been around the world, is focusing more right now on the United States. Can you tell us about your current assignment? Absolutely, Liz. So I've been a special agent for almost 22 years. Uh, that's actually hard to believe because I still feel like I'm 32. Maybe I don't look 32, but anyways, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be an agent and, and even prouder to be in the role that I am right now, working in congressional and public affairs in the community outreach and prevention support section. I'm currently the DEA 360 strategy coordinator. Uh, and let me just tell you a little bit about the DEA 360 strategy. We're in our fourth year. The DEA 360 strategy is a response to the opioid epidemic. So it's a three-pronged approach. It's law enforcement, diversion control, and community outreach. And so as part of the DEA 360 strategy, we're working with national partners uh, to include coalition partners, partnership for drug-free kids, um, advertising companies because we also run an ad campaign. We host events where in partnership with our local coalitions and local community partners and of course local law enforcement because we can't do what we do without them um, to bring youth and adults together in the communities to stand up and to take control and to take to, to give them empowerment in their neighborhoods uh, to take back affected neighborhoods after an enforcement action. So it's really that community outreach uh, partnership uh, that we're looking for as part of 360. And the goal, obviously, of the DEA 360 strategy is sustainability, to continue those efforts in the, in the community and have those community coalitions that exist long after the DEA 360 strategy implementation. Currently, and, and this is the last thing I'll say about DEA 360, but currently for 2019, FY 2019, we're in six cities, we're deploying six cities, and those six cities are Los Angeles, New Orleans, Tampa, Cleveland, New Bedford, and Flagstaff. Thank you. That's wonderful. And so the DEA Museum actually has an, an exhibit right now that's in Albuquerque, New York. So if anyone, Albuquerque, New Mexico. So if anyone is finding themselves in New Mexico and would like to see that, what we've been hearing is that there's this wonderful synergy between DEA in these 360 cities and then other activities that are happening there. So it's just been this fabulous feedback that seems to have been very helpful with addressing the problem. Absolutely. Um, and it's a big problem, isn't it, Steve? So yes, tell us sure. what, how you're helping to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been employed as a non-supervisory special agent of DEA since 1991. Mm -hmm. uh, my current assignment is in the DEA Special Operations Division, specifically the Bilateral Investigations Unit. Uh, since 2005, my assignment there has been to conduct bilateral investigations with our foreign counterparts and DEA agents in uh, foreign offices. Uh, specifically, the statute that I've been involved in working is Title 21, United States Code, Section 959, which essentially states that it is unlawful for anyone to manufacture or distribute a controlled substance knowing or intending or having reasonable cause to believe that that controlled substance is to be imported to the United States. So since approximately 2005-2007, my particular investigations have been focused uh, on Central America, particularly Guatemala, uh, and working essentially Sinaloa cartel operations uh, from Central America with the Sinaloa cartel representatives that exist in Central America and manage uh, transportation infrastructure of particularly co cocaine shipments that transit from South America through Central America into Mexico for distribution into the United States. This is an incredibly complicated job that you've all described. Um, it's, it, it's just a lot for, I think, any of us to take in. And I think that probably when you all started your careers a few years ago, that <laughs> this made, you know, you had to work your way up to this particular point in time. And one of the things that I always find fascinating is for, to find out how it was that you became interested in a career at DEA in the first place. And we will have a number, I think, of college students who are watching the live stream who would be very interested in knowing 
what your pathway was. So how did you decide that you wanted to be here? And then how did you get here? So I'm gonna start with Steve and work okay. my way back. I think, I think I'm the oldest one that's sitting here. Most <laughs> um, experienced. I grew up in the Northeast United States, in mm -hmm. Massachusetts. I was born in 64, so I grew up in the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, I had an uncle that was a police officer. Mm -hmm. um, I had a parish priest uh, who was a former FBI agent, actually, mm -hmm. and was a very close friend and still is of our family. So I had a a couple of mentors and um, whether it was the challenge or the adrenaline, I always had an interest in, in law enforcement. Uh, I got out of high school. Uh, there were some things that I was exposed to with local police that I was a bit disillusioned with. Uh, I did want to get involved in law enforcement, but I was a little skeptical about some of the local, um, local things that, that I saw going on. So I went to college as a criminal justice major. I did an internship with a grocery store in a loss prevention department. Um, I was fortunate enough to be partnered up in that internship with who I considered an, an old guy who was probably 55 years old or so, uh, who was a former Massachusetts state trooper. And through his assistance, he really kind of pushed for me to, to move towards federal law enforcement. So my, my sights were set on to be an FBI agent. So I got out of school. Uh, I took a job with the FBI in a support capacity. Um, I think my acceptance letter, I was making like $13,000 a year at that time in 1986. Uh, I worked nights, I worked the radio room, did mail runs and things like that. But for me, it was a, it was a foot in the door. Uh, as I was there at the FBI, I was thinking, um, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't exactly what I'm looking for. And actually, I should back up into 1985. I was a junior in college, uh, and all over the television was the kidnapping, uh, torture, and murder of DEA Special Agent Enrique Camarena. So at that time, I was maybe 18 years old as a junior in college. But uh, what I noticed about that was that you had an agency and an administrator named Jack Long uh, and he had a president of the United States that were able to, that were willing to go to measures to, to shut down the U.S.-Mexico border for essentially one of their own until that issue was resolved. And even as a young kid at that time, I found that uh, extremely impressive that any organization would go to those measures for, for one of their own. So, excuse me, that was how I, I learned about DEA essentially was that that particular, particular incident. So as I was working for the FBI, I actually started talking to DEA. Uh, DEA was not hiring at the time, so they referred me to the United States Naval Investigative Service, which is now uh, called NCIS, the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. I got hired by NCIS. I went to work for them as a special agent from 1987 to 1991. Uh, when I get contacted by DEA with a job offer. So I accepted my employment with DEA out of the Boston Field Division and uh, transitioned to Los Angeles as my first assignment. Wow. Yeah. And you've been here ever since? I've been in the Los Angeles Field yeah. Division, a couple different assignments, uh, the Dallas Field Division, and I've been in uh, a DEA classified project section in the DEA Special Operations Division. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's really interesting that people take different pathways to get here, and the common thread is often that there's a, you know, this interest in law enforcement. Yeah. And I think Michelle's pathway is, I think, uh, fascinating. I'd like you to share it with everybody. Of course. So um, when I first went to college, I was making a decision of what my major was going to be in to get my bachelor's degree. And I knew I wanted to be in law enforcement in some capacity, but the small school, St. Bonaventure University in Olean, New York, that I wanted to go to didn't have criminal justice as a major. So I decided to major in Spanish uh, to actually make me more marketable in the law enforcement field, to have a language ability uh, to make me more competitive with other prospective candidates and coming on the job. Uh, so I majored in, majored in Spanish, studied in Spain for a semester, came back and wasn't sure which branch but I, or which agency, but I knew I wanted to go into federal law enforcement. Um, also at the same time, I'll share a personal story. Uh, my twin brother has struggled with addiction for over 25 years. 
And at that time, that's when his addiction, his struggles with addiction began. And I knew that I saw the other side of it. So I knew that addiction didn't discriminate. Uh, whether you're in the White House and an outhouse, uh, you're at Yale or in jail, it doesn't discriminate. And so I also wanted to be on the other side of that. I wanted to protect and serve, and I wanted to take these traffickers off the street that were poisoning our streets with, with that were poisoning our streets with their drugs, essentially. Uh, so I looked at uh, DEA first, uh, but then Border Patrol actually had a expedited hiring process in our community. So I started to apply with Border Patrol, and they hired me within seven months. Um, so I took that route first, thinking that uh, I could ultimately get my foot in the door, so to speak, into the uh, inter Department of Justice at that time that U.S. Border Patrol was under. Uh, so I decided to go that route first. And the Academy for Border Patrol at that time, it still continues to be very, very paramilitary. Uh, so it was uh, standing at inspection, it was uh, marching to class, it was cadence, it was all of that. And it was six months long, and I believe that truly prepared me for the DEA Academy. Uh, and immediately when I, when I arrived uh, out of the academy into the field in San Diego, California with Border Patrol, I immediate, immediately applied to DEA. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, I stayed with U.S. Border Patrol until I was offered, uh, thankfully, a job by DEA as a special agent in 1997, and I haven't looked back because I know that absolutely this is the best fit for me, and I may be biased because I've been an agent for 21 years, but this is the absolute best job in the world, and there isn't anything else that I'd rather do. So that's my story. Oh, so Amador, do you agree that this is the best job in the world and there's nothing else that you'd rather do? I completely agree. Okay. I completely agree. Um, my story starts from when I was an early teenager. I grew up in a neighborhood, not so good neighborhood, um, gang infested. I mean, anything that comes with the gangs, drive-by shootings, everything was there. Uh, my next door neighbor was the high-ranking gangster in, in our area. And I think it was a family bond between his mom, my mom, that he actually respected us kids. I'm one of six and he made sure that we didn't go down the gang path. He let us know, hey, this isn't a life for you. And he let his guys know, do not recruit any of the Martinez kids, stay away from them, don't hassle them, don't try to recruit them. So from an early age, I saw what gangs and drugs and what that did to you. Um, I went to, when I was in high school, during one of my counselor sessions for picking my classes and what have you, it was before I was 16, because I wasn't driving at the time. I saw a flyer for how to become a police officer at the local uh, community college. So I told my mom, hey, this is what I want to do, this is where I want to go, and uh, yeah, she drove me to the community college, dropped me off, gave me my lunch, gave me my dollar for whatever else I may need. <laughs> told me to give her a call uh, when I was done, and when I left that uh, eight-hour seminar, I knew that was it. I knew I wanted to be a police officer. So knowing that, obviously still too young, I still got high school ahead of me, I at least knew that the path to being a police officer, a law enforcement officer, was doing the right thing, staying clean, off of drugs, off of alcohol, don't do anything out there that's going to get you in trouble, what have you. And I went through my high school, graduated from there, started junior college. But uh, in between high school and junior college, uh, obviously over 18, under 21, what have you, I started testing for with LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department. And I got through their first couple tests and I was still young. And at one point, I think it was my drive home from Los Angeles back home about an hour that I started thinking, what am I doing? I go, I'm too young to carry a gun. I'm too young to make these decisions. I don't have life experience. I don't want to be out there without the life experience making life and death decisions. So I decided to shelf the police officer route and go to finish my junior college. And then I went to a small school, also a San Diego State University. <laughs> So I went to San Diego State University, finished, uh, got my degree there. And once I graduated from San Diego State, sociology, nothing to do with law enforcement. Um, I moved out to Arizona where I was going to apply to Arizona State University for my master's. Um, as time went on there, I picked up that law enforcement uh, career again, um, started applying and testing with different uh, departments, one of them being DEA. And DEA just fast tracked me through the whole process. Uh, multiple tests on one day. If I passed those, I'd go back for multiple tests. As I passed those, go back for the last set of tests. And when I say fast track, it still took 13 months because there's an extensive background that gets done. But uh, during that time, I was working for an insurance company, making great money for <laughs> back in the day. I think uh, back in the day, I was in the mid 40s, 40, 000, 45,000 or so. 
and I too got my offer letter for DEA, come work for us, uh, go to the academy. Your pay will be 28000 and I'm thinking, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> I go, I've got, I've got my life here, I've got my house here, I've got everything, what am I gonna do? And it didn't take me long to realize it's not about the money, it's about your career and it's about your passion, it's about what you wanna do. And I called right back and I said, hey, yes, please sign me up, get me into that academy class. And I was placed into the academy class in January of 2000. And here we are 19 years later and I don't look back and it's not a bad decision and I don't regret that. I think this is the best move of my life for me, for my wife, my daughter, my family, my community, for everybody. And I'm passionate about this job and I encourage everybody, go the law enforcement route, come to DEA. It's a great, great career. Now, did you get your first choice duty assignment? Back in the day? Well, I got lucky. I got lucky because uh, back in the day, we'd go to the academy, and I don't remember how many weeks in you get uh, a roster of this is where all you agents have to go. Well, I got hired out of Phoenix, so I couldn't go back to Phoenix uh, because that was just the rule back then. You don't go back to the city you were hired out of. But available was Los Angeles. Well, there was nine or ten availabilities for Los Angeles, so I'm like, why would I not want to go home? So I was one of the guys who actually got to go home. So when Los Angeles was up on the board, my hand was the first one that go up. I'm like, I'll take that. And I didn't have to fight with anybody because nobody wanted to go to LA back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I got very lucky. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't think you got to go to your first choice, did you? No, no? I didn't. Um, as I said before, I was hired in 1991. Mm -hmm. At that time, you were given what they called the dream sheet, where you'd list three, three offices where you wanted to go to. The first office I listed was Miami, thinking coming off the 1980s era of the cocaine cowboys, mm -hmm. that would be a no-brainer, I'd be in Miami. My second office that I listed was New York, and the third office that I listed was Boston. Um, at that time you went to Quantico, I forget, maybe your fifth, sixth, eighth week or whatever. They brought you into a room in an auditorium, and you sat in a chair in the agent assignment personnel maybe eight or ten people sat up in the auditorium seats and they said, Agent Fraga, we understand that you have requested Miami, New York, and Boston. And I said, yes, sir. And they said, your first assignment is going to be Los Angeles, California. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. And they said, let, let us explain. I said, no, there's no need. There's, there's 48 or 52 other people out here. I signed a mobility agreement. I know what I signed on for, so I'm good with it. So, and you went. I took my 10 days to travel, drive 3,000 miles, and <laughs> yeah, started in Los Angeles, California. Oh, so your introduction yeah. was seeing the U.S., yes. seeing America. It's a pretty trip <laughs> if you need to make it. Okay. Now, Michelle, you've been a lot of places. Did you get your first choice duty assignment? Well, actually, just to back up for one uh, minute, um, now as part of the yeah. basic agent trainee um, assignment selections yeah. uh, out of the academy, um, back in the day when I went through as well in 97, it was conducted the same way. Uh, however, now um, the new recruits prior to going to the academy actually receive their assignment uh, ahead of time, which is actually great. Uh, and that's usually based on top three uh, cities that they um, submit as part, part of their preference list. Doesn't mean that, that necessarily they'll get any of those three, but uh, I think DEA does um, a good job in trying to do that and determining which would be the best fit. So when I came through, um, I hired out of San Diego, went back to San Diego for a little while, and then went to El Paso, Texas, um, which wasn't necessarily my first assignment, but I'm really glad that I did it um, because it's almost like trial by fire uh, when you get into a larger field division. And although El Paso is the smallest of the 23 field division offices, uh, there was a lot of work. And I was able to, of course, use my Span Spanish language ability, uh, sometimes Spanglish, depending how you, you say it. But uh, no, I was actually uh, very proficient in the Spanish language. And, um, you know, I really learned the dialect of Spanish uh, that would be used to work with informants um, and when arresting defendants to be able to speak with those defendants in the Spanish language. So um, not just for that reason, but for many other reasons, I was lucky to end up where I did in, in targeting the highest level uh, Mexican drug trafficking organizations. And I actually started on the mobile enforcement team, um, which they had then as well, uh, where you were actually part of a team that would travel to uh, different smaller cities or smaller towns within your area of responsibility, um, targeting 
gangs and drug trafficking organizations that existed, usually associated with violence, of course, that existed in those areas where the local law enforcement needed additional resources. So DEA would work very closely as part of those mobile enforcement teams um, that would deploy to those cities for a certain amount of time and then move on to their next assignment once there were um, the investigation culminated and a number of uh, folks in that community, the, the defendants obviously were arrested, the violators were arrested. Um, so that's how I started. Uh -huh. So it strikes me that when you're in the academy, as difficult as it may be, that you're in almost sort of a protected bubble because you're learning things that are very theoretical, are, are you not? So, and you're being pushed, but you're not exactly in the real world. But when you go to your first duty station, you are immediately in a real world situation. And I think in the places that you started were probably exceptionally real world situations in terms of the amount of work that needed to be done. So um, how is it as a young agent, and you can think about when you were the young agent and you all are working with people pretty regularly who are newer, younger, newer, they're not always necessarily younger, but newer to DEA, is how is it that someone goes about being acclimated to sort of like being thrust into this job? Uh, first of that. all, with mm -hmm. today's assignments, when an agent comes out of Quantico, they're mm -hmm. assigned a field training agent. Mm -hmm. The FTA program, I believe, started, um, it had to be around 1995, 96, around that time frame. So a new agent, when they come out of Quantico, along with everything that they've learned in the academy, whether it be their physical training, defensive tactics, uh, firearms training, um, legal training, practical exercises, search warrant execution, arrest and defensive tactics. Uh, they will get with this field training agent for, I believe it's a period of one, one year uh, to begin with. Uh, and in that period, um, that new agent is, is kind of mentored by that field training agent. Uh, any new agent that goes to a new office, uh, one of their concerns are how do I, how do I make cases? How do I build cases? Uh, but I think in most offices, any any new agent has the opportunity to either um, pick up uh, sections or what we call spin-offs of of cases that are existing in the office. Uh, they might start working with informants. They might start uh, interacting with defendants. There's a whole number of, of ways and varieties that, that somebody can start developing cases. But when all that comes together, it, it essentially um, you know, grows upon each step and you know, the agent begins to make cases, testify in court, collect evidence, and, and do the things that are required to do on this, on this job. So it sounds like teamwork is an incredibly important, important component of being in an office of learning how to do the job while you're on the job. And as folks with experience, I mean, you probably have advice right on the door for a new agent or? Yeah, no, of course. Mm -hmm. I think uh, everything that Steve says is 100% accurate mm -hmm. uh, to include the fact that uh, your field training agent is, it's, it's gonna be your, <coughs> your, your primary, your focal point. He's the one who's gonna make you. Um, I'll give the example of my training agent and a task force officer who was my training agent. So I got lucky that these two guys were partnered all the time and I became a third wheel with them. Now, what you do is you do everything that they do. When they go out on surveillance, you're out on surveillance. When they're writing reports, you're writing reports. When they're writing affidavits, you're writing affidavits. So for the first year, I was doing everything with them until what Steve said, you end up knowing the investigations, knowing what you're doing. You have your base of what you're doing, of what the job requires at the academy, but now you learn the real job out in the real world and you're doing full investigations. It's not like they're gonna baby step you with uh, street buys, uh, grams, ounces. You're doing the cartel investigations right off the get-go. Um, my training agent was a senior training agent who had been there for a long time. So when things were a little bit slow with us, he actually always found somebody. Hey, Almodor, why don't you go to group one over here? This is what they're doing. Hey, Almodor, why don't you go to group four over there? This is what they're doing. Go help, go learn, go keep um, acquiring more experience. Um, with that said, I made it a point to be first guy in the office. I mean, I'm the new guy. First guy in the office, last guy at the office, and where can I help? I'm a fluent Spanish speaker, so I did a lot of translations. I'd go out on the field with different groups to translate. 
And it's not just the translating part, but it's all about what they were doing that I could learn from and a little bit of takeaway. Um, the other duties as a new agent is you're going to have to witness evidence uh, early in the mornings, late at night. You get a lot of call outs for the things that don't require too much experience, but still require a witness. So you're that plus one guy that goes out there. But uh, bottom line is my advice is for the newer agents, try to be the first guy in the office, try to be the last guy in the office and look for work. When you don't have work, when your group doesn't have work or they're dealing with uh, evidence handling or different stuff that uh, you're not a part of, check to see which other group is working and what they're doing and if that's something uh, that's new experience or you can help out. Ask the boss, hey boss, can I run over there and take a look and uh, help them out? But always stay busy and always look for work is my, my advice. Because there's always work available. Absolutely. Yeah. And then as, as you become more experienced, then other opportunities will open up for you within DEA. And I know, Michelle, one of the opportunities that you took was to go work in foreign countries. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one, among the number of great things about DEA and being a special agent is the number of, of actually assignments that you have access to, that you have an opportunity to be part of. Um, we have 90 offices in seven, 70 countries at this time, um, so we have a huge foreign presence, and that's uh, is part of uh, under under the embassy and consulate missions. Um, essentially, that's how we operate in foreign countries. So, when I decided that I wanted to be a special agent, um, I obtained the domestic experience, and then decided that I would like to see uh, how the foreign operations work. Um, we go after the highest level drug traffickers, right? So that includes the sources of supply. So what better way to target the, those highest level offenders than to go overseas and to um, initiate those investigations, working with the foreign anti-drug counterparts, um, working bilateral drug investigations. Uh, so let me back up to a special mission that I also had an opportunity to be part of that was a four month deployment to Baghdad, Iraq. And I know Liz mentioned that in her opening comments, uh, or Lori did, but. That mission was the Regime Crimes Liaison Office, and it was part of a, DEA was part of a federal task force at that time uh, that deployed to Baghdad, Iraq, and to Qatar as well. Uh, and this was after the arrest of Saddam Hussein, and uh, we had an interest there to uh, assist the local counterparts in conducting an investigation into the crimes that Saddam Hussein had committed against his own people, uh, because the prosecutors um, essentially, the, there was no level of investigation um, under that regime. So part of this federal task force was to go in there and to assist the investigators and the prosecutors um, in setting up the Iraqi Special Tribunal, which was modeled after a U.S. court system, uh, and essentially gather evidence, interview witnesses, uh, members of uh, Saddam's regime as well, uh, because they were detained at that point, uh, as well as to interview witnesses gather this evidence, uh, work with the prosecutors, investigators to uh, build a case that could be utilized uh, to present to the Iraqi Special Tribunal, which at the time that I was there, part of the case that I had worked, which was the merchant's case, uh, was actually utilized to convict Saddam, Saddam Hussein in the Iraqi Special Tribunal, and, and as a result, he was hanged. Um, so that was a part of a special operation that uh, DEA was part of. Um, and it was for a short time, but uh, that, was, that was just something else that I was able to be a part of. But then I, in 2015, was accepted a, for a position as the country attache, which is essentially the highest ranking drug law, law enforcement officer uh, within that country, but also within the surrounding Arabian Peninsula. So from Dubai, United Arab Emirates, the DEA office there covered um, the UAE, also covered Saudi Arabia, Oman, Bahrain, Kuwait, and Qatar. Uh, so as part of our responsibility there was to work bilateral drug investigations with our foreign counterparts in all of those countries. Uh, we also were there in a liaison compa capacity um, to also assist the foreign counterparts with uh, training uh, and any sort of resources that we could provide. Um, but obviously our main goal was, was working bilateral drug investigations, going after the highest level traffickers, um, and of course those who would be uh, importing narcotics into the United States, um, essentially. Uh, and so as part of that mission, I did not have to learn the Arabic language uh, because it was mostly an English-speaking country, although for uh, certain meetings that I would have that would be within the UAE or outside of the UAE in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, we would have uh, foreign service nationals who worked with us as, as part of that mission uh, who would essentially act as translators and, and such. So, uh, you know, we had that ability. But I also did, on my own, take a Berlitz course uh, which was basically a familiarization 
um, course online that was that I was able to learn conversational Arabic to a degree uh, to be able to understand some things that were being said, especially in uh, certain situations where there might be a security risk. Well, and it seems to me, too, that if you're living in a culture as a good representative of the United States, that you want to be um, uh, uh, be part of that culture to the extent that you can. And it seems like Arabic would be a, a goodwill gesture. Is that something that you found? Mm -hmm. It's important to remember that as DEA, we are operating in foreign countries, but we're also operating um, not under our own authority, but under the authority of the U.S. State Department and in cooperation with the law enforcement counterparts because we don't have enforcement capability or jurisdiction in those countries, right? So we're living in their country and operating in their country, and relationships are of the utmost importance. And so part of that relationship building is to understand the culture, um, is to overcome any barriers that possibly could exist, uh, and, and make those relationships work. And I think that's one of the other things that DEA is really, really good at, is building relationships, whether in the foreign environment or whether uh, domestically. Um, so that's extremely important. Yes. And I know, Amador, you also have been stationed overseas. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I was fortunate enough to be yeah. selected to an assignment in Colombia. So I was a special agent, GS-13, in Cartagena, Colombia. Um, the greatest thing about Colombia is that we're able to go out on enforcement operations with the Colombian counterparts. So I was able to uh, see a lot of different enforcement activities and how they handled their work. Now, I wasn't a primary on enforcement. They're the primary on enforcement, but at least I'm out there with them taking a, taking a look at, at what they're doing. Uh, subsequent to my assignment in Colombia, I was promoted as group supervisor to Mexico City. Uh, Mexico City is more of a suit and tie guy, a liaison, and everything that happens in Mexico, Mexico happens through Mexico City because that's where the government, uh, government's at. So a lot of the taskings that I had to deal with there were incoming uh, incoming requests from domestic offices and other of the Mexico, Mexico DEA offices for me to go to the government uh, and make our requests. Most of my day was spent over with the government of Mexico, with the attorney generals, high-ranking uh, commanders of uh, federal police, uh, PGR, uh, other agencies there. And I just had a great time working and building up the relationships that the U.S. needs for us to do our job in those foreign countries. And I think the that what, um, that what we hear is that it is those relationships because uh, trafficking is a worldwide phenomenon. And I don't, that you haven't necessarily worked in foreign countries, but a big component of your job is to be looking at those patterns, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. I, uh, in my mm -hmm. capacity in this bilateral investigations unit from the Special Operations Division, mm -hmm. I have not physically been assigned to an overseas mm -hmm. post but I have been the um, essentially the case agent in the, the case agent group that works the, the cases and brings these cases to court that are taking place in our foreign offices in Mexico and, and Guatemala, so to speak. One of the advantages of the position that, that I've been in is that I can solely work cases. For an agent like Amador, whether it be in Colombia or Mexico or an agent in, in Guatemala, mm -hmm. those agents uh, are not only trying to, to work and develop cases, but they're, they're consumed with a number of collateral duties too, whether it be impress funds or um, liaison type functions in the embassy or hosting TDY personnel or uh, vehicle fleet inventories. Um, while these agents are assigned to foreign posts, they're, they have other duties other than being able to work cases. So we've been very fortunate through the Special Operations Division and the design that has taken place through headquarters in SOD to be able to have these groups that can work in conjunction with the overseas offices from the standpoint of solely working the cases and gathering that evidence in conjunction with the foreign offices. And I've been just fortunate in that capacity through the support that I've had through through management, whether it be group supervisors, ASACs, SACs, the support personnel uh, in the offices, whether it be SOD or headquarters, to be able to just you know enjoy that that position that I've had, have just been very fortunate from that standpoint. Well, and it strikes me that what's changed a lot in the world over the last couple of decades is um, very much related to the changes in technology. 
Uh, when we spoke with the forensic science panel last month, you know, they pointed out that flip phones were the technology of choice uh, not that long ago. Um, and it's because of the changing technology that so many things have become more difficult. And I'm wondering um, how technology has affected both the way that you do your job, but uh, how you, but also how the other side you know, how the bad guys are doing their job. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a tough yeah. one because uh, yeah. technology and without getting into specifics right. and the details of mm -hmm. what it does to us, um, law enforcement, it really makes our job difficult. Um, you go from Blackberry push to talks to the flip phones over to smartphones into uh, apps to communicate between your line, Snapchat, mm -hmm. WhatsApp, or uh, whatever else you have out there. It really presents challenges for law enforcement and we'll leave it at that. Um, but on the flip side, there's a lot of new technology out there that makes our job easier. Um, one of the stories that I had told uh, earlier was when I came back out domestically to the field and one of the agents wanted to do surveillance on a guy to see what his daily activities were, I said, great, let's do it. Uh, what do we do? Wake up five, six, seven o'clock, get out there and watch where he goes first thing in the morning? And he says, no boss. He goes, I just pull up my phone and I'm going to tell you where he goes and that's where we're going to meet. I'm like, well, now wait a minute. That takes the fun out of the surveillance. But again, <laughs> it tells you where these guys are going. It tells you when he moves, where he goes, and now you have a starting point. So instead of starting at 6 in the morning, just sitting there for three hours waiting for the guy to wake up and get moving, now you're on hold, doing your job, getting ready, handling other business. Then you go ahead and react to that time soon. In a sense, those are the little examples of what has, uh, what presents challenges to us, but also what helps us out. Right. Now, Steve, mm -hmm. I think that your career predates flip phones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. Does anyone remember what a payphone is? Yeah. A I beeper? have a yeah. photo of one that I took yeah. a couple weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, we used to, um, in, on surveillances, we would, we would follow guys to pay phones and then we'd have to mm -hmm. go through the mechanism of going to we would go and make a call after the uh -huh. the person we were surveilling made a call and then we'd have to go to the phone company that managed that pay phone and do subpoenas and try and identify the number that the person called uh -huh. but um, yeah we went through you know pay phones pagers mm -hmm. the first uh, lunchbox cell phones and in technology like Commodore said is, is forever changing so it makes it extremely important to have young people yeah. who are current on technology that have an interest in law enforcement for DEA to be recruiting those people because they become such an asset to this agency and mission because it's just it's so hard to it's so hard to keep up with so that the mindsets and the technology have to stay current and we keep in mind too that we have to unlike the bad guys the bad guys use the technology but they don't have to comply with the laws that we have to comply with when we're trying to use the same technology to to make cases against the bad guys. Yeah. So it's uh, it's challenging, yeah. and, and it works. It works for us. We get it done, but it's it's not easy. Because uh, nothing's easy, right. Right? especially with the pace of change. And I know, right. Michelle, that you travel an awful lot for your job, and you talk to an awful don't you? <laughs> right. And you talk to an awful lot of particularly community-based organizations, probably young people, and I would imagine that you're occasionally asked uh, for some career advice. And if somebody asks you, um, what are some of the qualities that it takes to be a great agent with the DEA, what would you tell them? Yeah. Well, I would start by saying that the DEA Academy trains you and prepares you really well. Um, I'm very, very proud of our training staff there at the Academy because uh, they're always keeping up with the latest technology and, and being able to use that as part of the training techniques to prepare the agents for uh, the field so that essentially when they arrive at their first duty station, they're ready to go to um, conduct special agent activities and, and to conduct investigations. Um, so I would say that uh, dedication, passion, absolutely have passion for what you're doing. No matter where that passion comes from, figure out what that is and, and use that to drive you through your career. Integrity, number one, um, because you're going to be in positions where you're going to have access to a lot of things that you're not going to have access to as a civilian. 
behind that badge carries a lot of responsibility and also carries a lot of credibility. When you show up in a community and, and you have a badge that you're standing behind, remember what that means. And remember what that represents. You have now responsibility to the community prote to protect and serve. And why I do what I do is to keep our communities safe. It's where I live, it's where all of you live. So protecting your communities and saving one life at a time, to be quite honest, from the epidemic that we're currently experiencing and for the epidemics to come. Um, because we know that, that generally every decade um, those drug trafficking trends change. And unfortunately this is a situation that we're in, that in 2017 we lost over 70,000 Americans to drug overdoses. And think about that as a Boeing 737 airliner carrying 178 passages and crew members crashing every day. Those are the amount of people, 190 people that we're losing, 192 to be specific, every single day. So draw that passion from somewhere and be proud of what you're doing and remember the responsibility, huge responsibility that that badge carries. And there's only one more thing I'm gonna say. Remember who you are at the core and that's actually an acronym that I use. I've used this throughout my entire career, C-O-R-E. And I'll start by saying C is confidence. Always have that confidence in yourself. And when you're able to instill that confidence in other people, whether on the job or outside the job, do that. Opportunity, always, no matter what, take any opportunity that comes your way because you're not sure what door that's gonna open. Right, and those opportunities for me came because I saw what was behind door number one, right? I took it and I said, what could be next for me? And it opened up a whole bunch of other doors and made me who I am today. Respect, have respect for yourself, always. Carry yourself with utmo the utmost professionalism on the job and off, remember that, and off, because that's hugely important. And when you're able to instill, or, or essentially having respect for yourself, but also others, no matter what walk of life those people come from. Anyone that you work with, defendants that you're coming across, violators, no matter how, how angry you might get at, at their actions, always conduct yourself with that respect and have respect for others. And the last would be E, empowerment. Empowering yourself, giving yourself the tools. Maybe you don't always have those tools readily available to you, but get those tools accessible for yourself so you can empower yourself to do the job and empower others to do their job when you're in that position, such as myself and others up here on the panel, when you're in a supervisory capacity, empower others and give them the tools that they need to succeed. And don't ever forget where you came from. That's number one, because we all started somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I have. Yeah. That's, that's really powerful, Michelle. And I'm really happy that you've reminded us and then everybody here is that this isn't just a job. You're not coming in from nine to five every day. Is that there's really, there's a bigger purpose here that this is a mission-driven agency. And while the DEA enforces the drug laws of the United States, that's, that means something to a lot of people. And so what is it that is really important about the mission to, to each of you? Well, DEA's primary mission is to identify, disrupt, and dismantle large-scale drug trafficking organizations. As a DEA agent, uh, I like to tell people that more important than our title of being a special agent, our, our job series is actually as a GS-1811 criminal investigator. Um, to touch on something that Michelle said, you know, it's, it's very important to me as a criminal investigator for people to understand that what our job is is to confirm or refute allegations. Um, to refute an allegation in the, in the United States judicial system is every bit as important as to confirm an allegation. Uh, there are people out there that are, are innocent of what they're accused of. And you know, so I go back to stress the importance of, of that job of a criminal investigator and that respect for people that Michelle talks about uh, and the importance for an agent or a criminal investigator to maintain their impartiality when conducting investigations. Um, I've found that my best successes on this job are when you're sitting across the table from, from bad guys and I've had the experience to sit across the table from some very high level traffickers uh, from different countries is that the most bang for your buck comes from treating people like people mm -hmm. to be able to identify with them maybe to put yourself in their shoes uh, if 
I take a look if I were born in that person's culture, mm -hmm. maybe I would resort to have done the same things that they did to, to, for them to survive and to provide for their families. I also recognize sometimes that if some of those folks were born in my culture, they have the management skills, communication skills, organizational skills that maybe they'd be Fortune 500 executives if they were, if they were born here. So, you know, I've always um, never forgotten that and found that the best way to succeed on this job is, is that respect and treating people like people. So it's a, I, I kind of got yeah. off path from your yeah. original question, I think, but, um, you know, this is a fabulous job. I've done this for, it's 33 years total. Uh, there have been very few days where I have not enjoyed going to work. Uh, it's, you know, which I think is pretty, pretty commendable. Uh, at the same time, uh, it can not be an easy job. It's tough on families. People transfer around to different assignments. Uh, you're, you may be 3,000 miles away from, from where your immediate family is. Uh, there's a whole host of different things that people experience on this job that are, that are tough. But DEA is an agency that truly, truly takes care of its own. Uh, when, you know, I, I can speak of, of thousands of occasions on this job where this agency just comes together as, as family. And, and not only the agent core, but the support core and the, the intel side of things and the, you know, the retirement people or the people that are doing, you know, vehicle management. It's just a, a fabulous, fabulous group of people. Yeah, it's just wonderful to work for. That's, I'm going to give you the last word, and that is the same question, is why is what we do so incredibly important? I think it just comes down to keeping uh, my family, your family, the community safe. Um, we can disrupt the flow of drugs. We can do our part to make sure that uh, the U.S. is inundated with drugs. So to me, the reason I do this job is to keep families and communities safe and as best as I can to ensure that we uh, disrupt the flow of uh, drug trafficking. Okay. I want to thank all three of you for coming and spending a lot of time with us both before today and today. I've found that everything that you've said is just so interesting and then here at the end inspiring too. It makes me feel really good about being with the Drug Enforcement Administration. And what I'd like to do now is open the floor to questions. For our streaming audience, if you go to deamuseum.org, you will find an email address on that page. And you can email a question. And we have the capability to read it here in the auditorium. Uh, if we don't get to your email questions, we'll make sure that we send them around and answer them later on. For those of you who are in the auditorium, we have folks on both sides with microphones. If you can raise your hand, please do use the microphone so that the streaming audience can hear your wonderful question. Thank you. Um, if it's possible to say, which of these is a bigger problem? Um, illegal drug manufacturer smuggling, uh, s supplying addicts and, and, and drug crime of that type, or diversion of lawful uh, prescription medications, which seems to be, as a layperson trying to understand this, is a totally different field, not of creeps in the night, but pharmacists and doctors and, and uh, large uh, manufacturing corporations. Are these both equally a problem, or is one bigger than the other? Go ahead. No, sure. Do you want to? No, no, okay. Okay. Uh, So I'll comment to that. Um, I can say that uh, the problems on both ends, but I can also say this: that 99.9% .9 of those who uh, practice medicine are practicing according to the proper standards and within the ethical guidelines. Um, that outlying 1%, um, I would say that that's who DEA goes after. That's who we're targeting if they're operating outside the law as a DEA registrant. Uh, so essentially. Um, our tactical diversion squads are a large part of that in conducting those investigations and arresting doctors who may be operating outside the law uh, to answer your question. And our diversion control uh, program here and our diversion program managers in the field as part of the diversion um, groups 
They also are working regulatory aspects. They're educating our practitioners through the Practitioners Drug Awareness Conferences and being able to educate those, in the, those practitioners in the medical field and engaging regularly with the um, pharmaceutical industry, whether that be uh, manufacturers, whether that be uh, pharmacists, doctors, um, distributors, um, those in the pharmaceutical industry are that we're regularly engaging with them uh, to prevent diversion, essentially, of pharmaceuticals. Right. And the next panel discussion we have will be with diversion. So keep an eye on deamuseum.org for the time, date, and location of that panel discussion. And maybe you can ask the same question. Right. Do we have any other questions in the audience? as the microphone makes its way. Okay. Um, this is, I guess, actually for Michelle mostly. I mean, others can comment too, but it's about the 360 strategy. Um, I heard the places where it was set up, and I was kind of curious what determined those places as the priority for setting those up, because I feel like if it's aimed, I mean, you talked about the opioid epidemic, and I think there are certain areas where that might possibly be worse with overdose rates, such as, I mean, I think of Baltimore comes to mind first, but that wasn't one of the cities mentioned. So how, does, how do you prioritize or determine to set up the 360 strategies in those areas? Thank you for your question. That's a good question. Um, in the interest of time, I didn't mention the other 360 cities that were part of the DEA 360 strategy in previous years. Uh, so to answer your question directly about Baltimore, in 2018 and currently ongoing DEA 360 strategy deployment is occurring in Baltimore. Uh, so we actually do have um, an upcoming event this Wednesday that will be an adult, an adult summit, training summit, as part of the DEA 360 strategy efforts there in Baltimore uh, this Wednesday, June 5th at the University of Baltimore. Uh, so we are actively engaging in those communities. To answer the broader question that you asked, that's also a good question, uh, we actually did just start on analyzing the data for the, 2000, the upcoming FY 2020 cities. And what we usually do as part of that process is first to gather CDC data, uh, Center for Disease Control and Addiction, to gather that data, overdose data that's specific to state, but then narrowing it down by county uh, to see what the uh, percentage is per population of the uh, overdose stats, essentially. Um, so whether that involves pharmaceuticals, whether it involves heroin and fentanyl or other drugs, um, then we can narrow it down um, by opioids to, as well um, in certain instances. So. We use, utilize that data, but then we also utilize um, additional information. So um, DOJ's National Public Safety Partnership, um, we utilize some stats uh, from that program as well. And we gather that information, make our preliminary decision, but then we also reach out to our DEA offices in those cities to determine that they can support the program with various resources and also determine uh, the existence of, a, of coalitions in that community. Um, and that's through SAMHSA's drug-free communities uh, information as well that we gather to determine if there are existing coalitions in those communities that would be a great starting point for DEA 360 strategy efforts. Uh, so that's essentially how we determine uh, which cities will, will be designated. Okay. Good. Are there any more questions? Are there any questions on email? Or are there any more questions in the audience? Can you speak about the work of a special agent with task force work, uh, working with state and local counterparts domestically um, first, and then perhaps working with our host government law enforcement organizations in overseas offices? How does that? work or don't work? Um, I can touch okay. on the beginning. I can touch on the, the task force portion with you. When I, was, when I was sent to Los Angeles in 1991, my first assignment was to a HIDA task force, High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. Uh, I worked in that task force from 1991 until it was approximately 1996 when I transferred down to the Santa Ana, DEA Santa Ana resident office. But for my first five years on the job, I worked in a task force setting where I worked for Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department supervisors. Uh, as a young agent, uh, we didn't have the field training agent program then, but my, my mentors or FTAs, if you will, were, were guys that were from different agencies, uh, immigration, ATF. Uh, we had LA County Sheriff's, LAPD, immigration, ATF, IRS. Uh, and a couple of other agencies in the group that I was in. 
uh, I did a, a stint in Tulsa, Oklahoma for a couple of years, uh, which was a task force office. Um, fabulous setting. Um, it, it was truly maybe because it wasn't as big as Los Angeles. I mean, it was a smaller area. You had uh, task force personnel from Tulsa PD and Tulsa County Sheriff's Department that were fabulous investigators, extremely experienced. Uh, there was some knowledge that we brought to them um, in the, mainly in the category of doing some wiretap programs there. But we, when we combined their knowledge of the local area with the expertise that we had with the phone capacities. I mean, we did things in, that, in those counties that they were not able to do for 10 years prior. So when we, when we pulled that experience together, it was fabulous. And also during that time frame in Tulsa, uh, we were involved in a lot of precursor methamphetamine um, products at that time late 1990s, a lot of pseudoephedrine that was being used for super labs in California was actually uh, coming from um, Texas, Oklahoma. You could, you could find those chemicals in mom and pop convenience stores in pretty rural areas. So Oklahoma at that time, during the time that I was there in Tulsa was the first, um, was the first state uh, in which companies like Walmart and things like that took those precursor things off the shelves, which, which transitioned through other, um, other states within the country. So the importance of task forces with DEA to pull those, the, the expertise from, from different levels and different experiences together is, is phenomenal. And with the, although I'm a bit removed from the, the local impact things, uh, today, I'm certainly aware of the, the issues uh, that happen in our communities, uh, and uh, you know I, I can't speak enough of the importance of those task forces to be able to address those those issues because it's it's so necessary. There's no one no one agency that can do it all themselves. It's really uh, it's it's a reliance upon agencies coming together in those task force settings to be successful. And if I can just add to that. Uh, as part of the task force setting, I was a supervisor of a DEA task force in Buffalo, New York, at our resident office there. And the task force actually consisted of 11 task force officers and four special agents. And what a task force officer means, for those of you who are listening that aren't aware, county, state, and local law enforcement officers are, are deputized to enforce, enforce the federal drug laws as special agents do. So they're deputized to um, work under Title 21 authority, which is what DEA has to conduct our investigations and our, and our operations. Uh, so essentially, the task force officer becomes one of us. Um, he doesn't directly, uh, he's not a DEA agent, he or she is not a DEA agent, but is deputized as a task force officer to essentially do almost everything that a special agent does. And so without that support from our state, county, and local law enforcement uh, teams, we couldn't, we couldn't do what we do. Um, we're hugely successful, and in almost every office that I can think of, depending on the size, has at least one task force environment that we operate in. That's just an, an, to add what, to what Steve said. And in the foreign arena, I can, discuss, I can talk to that. In the foreign arena, we can't, literally cannot do our job without the host nation uh, police officers. We have no access to foreign uh, databases, police databases. We have no arrest authority, investigative authority. We literally can't do our jobs. So what we do in the foreign arena is we are the greatest liaisons between information information coming from the U.S., information going to the vetted or trusted uh, police units in those foreign countries so that they can do their job. And by, allow, by giving them the information that they need to do their job, they can further investigations that further help us. Now, domestically, the last thing I'll add is the same thing. Domestic TFOs bring a lot to us. We don't just give them uh, tools that, for them to succeed. They actually bring tools for us to succeed. They have the street experience, they know their neighborhoods, they know their areas, they have local databases, they have a lot more information that we don't have access to. So by putting together our information and their information, whether you're talking about domestically or foreign, it just helps build that investigation, it helps that investigation go a lot further. That's, it's so interesting. And I, I wanna <coughs> say thank you so much to Amador and Michelle and Steve for joining us today. I am an incredibly lucky person that I got to meet with them several times before today and learn an awful lot about what it is to be a special agent with DEA. 
And we are so appreciative that you took the time to do this discussion today. For the folks who are watching us and for the folks who may want to follow up afterwards, this conversation will be available on deamuseum.org for a very long time. And a transcript will be up in about a week. So thank you all for those of you who came today to support our panel, for those of you who are watching online. And please join us next month when we have our next discussion. One last thing. Yeah. I have to say this, or because I'm sorry, but I have to, <laughs> is that we need more female special agents. So for you yes. females that are out there, women, we, we have so many smart, intelligent female agents on the job. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that we need, we'd mo we need more of the female special agents, prospective candidates who are out there who are interested in this job. It is a male-dominated field, um, but we can, we can coexist, and we have talents that uh, some of the men also don't have, and that's why we exist that's right. with great teamwork. So, so please um, talk to me if any of you are interested, even in the audience who's listening uh, in the live stream. I'd be more than happy to talk to you. And Michelle Thank will be you. your mentor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.